you're never quite the same after a cancer diagnosis. What patients really need is this sort of um, supportive care. There's 23 countries that don't have access to radiation therapy at all. So we work closely with um, WHO for the Global Breast Cancer Initiative. Building health literacy doesn't actually help the healthcare industry. Hello, everyone. Nice to be with you again to a new episode from Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Today with Carolyn Taylor from Global Focus on Cancer. Carolyn, hello. Nice to have you, uh, have you with us today. How are you? Good, thanks. Great to be with you. Thank you for uh, accepting my invitation. Um, you are uh, the founder and executive director of Global Focus on Cancer NGO, uh, which is quite active in the field of NGOs uh, dealing with uh, cancer care, cancer issues. Could you share for our audience the story or behind this idea? Or Yeah, sure. So, um, like many people who run NGOs working in this field, um, I come to this work out of my own experience with cancer. So in 2006, I was diagnosed with ovarian and endometrial cancers. I was 43. I was extremely fortunate to have an early diagnosis for both cancers, I'm able to make a full and total recovery. But, you know, as many people, you're never quite the same after a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I really wanted to do something to give back, but I was a photographer at the time. That was my profession. Um, but one day I got a random email from British Airways. It was a contest offering 10 free flights. You would write three essays saying what you would do with those flights. And it came to me that I really wanted to do a photo documentary project on the global face of cancer to show that regardless of where we live, the color of your skin, what God you believe in, cancer affects us all. And so I won. And over the course of a year, between 2010 and 2011, I went to 14 countries interviewing cancer patients, um, caregivers, healthcare providers, really trying to give this face to what cancer looked like. And many of the countries I went to, the bulk of the countries were lower middle income countries. And I saw this incredible inequity in cancer care, particularly in supportive care, um, awareness and education for patients and their families. And so I found it Global Focus on Cancer, GFC, to really try to address those issues and provide some sort of evidence-based models of supportive care for patients and their families in low-resource settings. Uh, you mentioned that um, your, let's say, work, uh, it's on uh, low-middle-income countries. How come you choose this? Uh, yeah, so when I saw the disparity, it was hard to not do something. So, you know, I, I come from New York. I had so many options of doctors and hospitals and places for my my treatment. But what I saw um, on those trips and interviewing people was that 70 to 80 percent of cancer patients in low and middle income countries are diagnosed at late stages of the disease with little hope for survival. So tremendous um, issues with health literacy, people not understanding their diagnosis, overcrowded uh, hospitals, too many, too many patients, not enough clinicians, um, nurses to kind of support patients where, you know, they had very little time with their doctor, even for to be delivered a diagnosis and treatment plan. Sometimes only three to five minutes is all they would get. Um, and also, you know, multiple patients sharing a bed. I remember the first time I went to Tanzania in 2011, there were four oncologists for the entire country. So these disparities that were existing were really just, you know, harming patients and their families so much. And I thought, well, this is maybe an area that we could focus in to try to really help. Uh, what you mentioned uh, earlier about sharing a bed, about uh, not enough, uh, let's say, clinicians, especially uh, psychologists. Uh, this uh, also in the former Eastern Europe because uh, it's a huge gap between uh, development countries and low middle income countries, even middle income countries. It's the same, for example, in Romania, where uh, psychologists have to see 1000 patients, which is quite impossible. So, yeah, so it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, what I want to ask you, 
uh, about uh, you, you mentioned the reality yeah. of uh, of cancer uh, issues in these countries. Uh, what about the let's say a psychosocial uh, point of view, but not in the terms of classical anxiety and uh, depressive issues. More about hope and trust. I would like yeah. to mention. So, so I do think, I mean, I think they go hand in hand, right, too. So, and I think what patients really need is this sort of um, supportive care. So like we were saying, in these low resource settings, there's limited access to healthcare services in general. And this kind of prioritization of medical interventions as opposed to treating a patient in a patient-centered way, like looking at what are those obstacles and barriers that are, are really so challenging. And in that like psychosocial support, so it's like really access to information, um, access to logistical needs and concerns can be really profound as well. So often, um, you know, cancer centers are kind of um, in one main area, people have to travel great distances to um, get to the, the treatment services. They have to stay there for quite a period of time. So just those transportations and housing services can be this big barrier to treatment, let alone the distress and anxiety, which even though we want to put that in, and a lot of our work really does go to alleviate that, particularly using peers um, for peer support. Um, but again, this is... While we know there's this huge need for psycho psychosocial support, especially where stigma is high and mental health resources are limited, it's just too hard because we know even in high resource settings, it's not implementable very often, or it's not implemented very often. I know um, in preparation for International Psycho-Oncology Society, their, their annual meeting, you know, we had a high, low resource setting kind of uh, plenary. And we were talking about how you know, while IPOS wants to use the distress thermometer as the sixth vital sign, even in the Netherlands, they don't want to implement it because then they actually have to triage patients into some sort of care and it's not covered again, or, you know, it's really left to people to find this on their own. And it's just so challenging at a time when your, your physical needs and your emotional needs are not being met. Uh, you mentioned Netherlands, we both, and IPOS, we both were to the latest Congress and uh, it was an idea about the golden age of uh, oncology. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, thinking about uh, low middle income countries, uh, I, I can't be, I can't agree with this because it's a huge uh, lack of information. It's a huge gap of cancer access. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are still two issues on, let's say, the market that the uh, majority of specialists, uh, let's say, avoid it. Stigma in cancer care and inequality in cancer care access. What do you think about these two issues? So yeah, it's stigma is something we deal with quite a lot because particularly um, where we're working, like right now in Rwanda, we have a project there. I've never seen stigma so high as it is there, quite honestly, um, particularly around women's cancers and abandonment of women when they are diagnosed. Um, you know, it's the lack of education. It's something you know. You know also, at World Cancer Congress, there was I was in a session on health literacy. And this is just such an opportunity lost by society to not build health literacy in um, schools. When children are young to start to build health literacy, it's this onus gets put on people once they're diagnosed with something to build their health literacy around that and kind of get to speed with where a clinician has been studying, you know, their adult life to be at that point. Um, and that onus of, of stigma and health literacy together is really this huge gap, I think, in society and where we really need to make better investment. And again, by engaging people with lived experience in the research priorities, in understanding where these gaps are and service gaps in service provision as well, and how we can build better systems that really treat people more holistically. And about inequality in, in cancer care? Yeah. So 70% of cancer-related deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries, and only 5% of funding, of all cancer funding, finds its way 
to those settings. So there's enormous inequity in just what is funded, where it's funded, um, and the outcomes for people in these settings. Um, it's something we really need to think about more equitably. How do we get more, more clinicians trained? How do we build more? And it's not even just about clinicians, you know, it's about pathology services being built. There's 23 countries that don't have access to radiation therapy at all. So how do you get that in place? And how do you have the physicists in place then to run that? So it's complicated. Um, and, you know, the colonization of many countries has been what's really caused the demise of, of these programs and that, um, you know, as people try to build back, there's so many things on the table that it's deprioritized unless there's good advocacy, which is a challenge too. How do you advocate for these services? I saw, uh, because we are talking about numbers, uh, also on your uh, website, uh, Global Focus on Cancer website, I, I saw a lot of statistics and uh, more, for example, than 60% uh, of all cancers occur in these low middle in income countries, which is uh, qu quite not a problematic issue, but it's a urgent issue that uh, international institutions has to do something in this regard. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in addition, are you um, working, for example, with WHO, you mentioned IPOS, and uh, with other organization, if you can tell yeah, us? Yeah, we work quite closely with WHO, particularly um, um, on a steering committee for people with lived experience, meaningful engagement, and what that looks like. Um, they're on NCDs, so there's two of us that represent cancer in there. So really looking at that, and then also we work closely with um, WHO for the Global Breast Cancer Initiative. The um, On the technical advisory group, we helped you know build those materials out and actually are in the implementation arm for Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And that, so really trying to take the WHO policies and turn them into programs and implement and implement them, but also engaging people with lived experience in addition to medical ex experts, making sure and we work with City Cancer Challenge in that way as well, and building, um, you know, really this framework of being more pe people centered. Um, you know, there's person centered, patient centered, and people centered kind of three kind of concepts there. So really looking um, looking at that, how do we make things more patient centered? How do we, you know, look at the research and and kind of aim the research towards what's important and valuable to people with cancer as well? Uh, <clears throat> you work uh, as an NGO. And um, in general, um, NGOs are very active in this uh, uh, field of uh, low middle income countries. Uh, we talk about WHO policies. Um, as far as I know, they don't have like a special department concerning cancer issues. Uh, what I want to ask you is that um, when you want to help, you have to follow some regulation made for example, by WHO, or you have to follow some uh, uh, some uh, rules, or no. it's, it's, uh, <laughs> so like it's you understand what I, what I mean, because... Yeah, 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 so I mean, the WHO tools are there, and we are very happy to help with build the, those out and guide the implementation, but in general, our work is not necessarily WHO-based work. So one of our main, we started with our, a lot of our work was in Vietnam, we're a very small organization. So what we really wanted to do was build like a core set of strategies with tools to address how you can fill the void in supportive care in low and middle income countries, looking at these frameworks of already overworked, um, you know, medical society, medical um, personnel, and then under, you know, just a dearth of psychosocial, psychological support of trained people that are able to, to provide that support and care, but working with them and people with lived experience to build sustainable models that are both appropriate for the resource um, and for, um, you know, for the culture where we're working. So we use an implementation science framework and lens, and we partner with academics to kind of build these more holistic programs. 
So the one program that we've gotten quite a lot of um, leverage in and, and moved the needle quite a bit forward is in this evidence-based model of peer-to-peer -peer support. So in most countries, you've got this survivorship group that is sitting there and they're kind of organically providing peer support to people with cancer. Um, but we were able to kind of make a liaison between the academic and medical side and the NGOs of survivor groups to kind of build new models of peer-to-peer -peer support that are have oversight where people are trained, where there's competencies, where um, there's you know working together with the medical system and people with lived experience to build um, to kind of fill that gap in professional psychosocial support and provide some informational and navigational needs for people with cancer and their families. Uh, you mentioned the uh, cultural, let's say, factor and the culture behind uh, states and countries. Is this uh, cultural factor uh, something that uh, make uh, your work uh, become hard? Or um, it's yeah, a no, document, or are you yeah, using no, a culture navigator or mediator? So I think what's really important is, I mean, there's frameworks out there for it, right? Like the Castro model of cultural and resource adaptation. So we really looked at that lens as to what adaptations would be needed to a program to make it relevant. And then working with our partners there to identify what changes. So particularly like in Vietnam, trainings aren't done individually, but as a group because of the collectivist nature of the society there. We also look at translation, simple translation, um, and then again, adapting different different tools to combat, say, stigma that's different in what the stigma, the different types of stigma, right? So there's the different types of stigma that are all at all different levels um, and looking at it within each society what that stigma is. So really helping each person group we're working with to build out this framework based on their needs and their population and always including people with lived experience from the beginning in the design and implementation, but also looking at like where if in Vietnam, like we, there's the hierarchical nature too. So it had to be based in the hospital setting to get real approval by everyone. And uh, you have support from local authorities or from- uh, no Always. Yeah, we always make sure because we want things to be sustainable, right? And, and appropriate and sustainable and have ownership. So, um, you know, we'll work to provide seed funding and training um, to build this out. We also have built a, this toolkit with a you know, a global implementation strategy arm where people can come to a hub, where people can come together and share their experiences as we introduce the program globally. Yeah. So get that, that kind of peer support that way as well in in terms of people um, launching programs and being able to share that information with other people launching as well it's really beneficial it, it, it seems that it's not an easy task task because you are coming coming with uh, so many informations and uh, issues to implement and uh, then you have to uh, get uh, not the approval but to be on the same side with the local authorities, with the government, and work together for the uh, local communities and uh, for patients, because they are the most important. In they, yeah, this, uh, they are. Um, and, you know, it's been a far, you know, a hard task, I guess, you know, a lot of learning for me as coming from being a food photographer to, um, you know, working in this space, but we've had great advisors um, and people who have really helped us um, grow the work in an appropriate way with the correct research attached to it. Um, so we've been really fortunate in having wonderful advisors that have come in to really help us guide and steer the programs in an evidence-based way and running clinical trials as well to make sure that things are running well. But then again, getting government buy-in for yeah. sustainability, it's, yeah, it's complicated, but it's, you know, it's not that much once you get a system going. Yeah, and unfortunately we, we can't do without, uh, so we, um, I will, uh, I would like to ask you now because 
uh, in this field of psychology and oncology uh, there are from time to time some terms that everybody are using it and now uh, everybody's talking about awareness prevention education and uh, uh, for example in low middle income countries but not also i mentioned again eastern europe is the same thing yeah. cancer means that sentence so what is your opinion with uh, yeah with this so, gap? Um, and so that's why we partnered a lot with the um advocates uh, people with lived experience that are these kind of vocal leaders and really showing like stigma combating stigma through their lived experience through them you know saying look we're here we're helping we're fine we're not going anywhere so i think that you would have to have it coupled with um, like awareness and education with ways to destigmatize. So part of the problem we're having right now in Rwanda was getting enough. Um, we're doing an evaluation study actually, so we actually didn't need um, IRB, but we got it because we do want to publish. So um, you know we're, we're running a, a small study on the kind of evaluating this toolkit for implementing peer support there. But we were having a hard time recruiting enough people, patients into the program because people don't want to go for screening and they don't want to go. And then there's no linkage. So we're looking at how we can, you know, kind of use the peers um, to drive a bit of awareness and to, to screening. Um, and partnering with other organizations. So, you know, we recently saw that Electa Foundation was doing cervical and breast screenings in Rwanda. So we immediately reached out to them and had a meeting with them. And now we're going to look at how we can partner with them. So once people come in the system, when they are screened, we can triage them right to a peer mentor to help them stay in the program. Um, because there is a lot of issue, particularly in LMICs, with people adhering to treatment because they don't understand the process. They don't understand there's often, they have to travel great distances again. So these fragmented healthcare systems and challenging to bring this in, but using the peers to try to help them kind of navigate. And as this hope for, of, you know, lived experience of someone who's a survivor can really help. So using them that way, you know, I think you're always pivoting a bit to like, and I think you have to be quite nimble in your approach in the work um because you have to pivot sometimes <laughs> to make it to make it fit and to make it work based on where you are so i think that's that's a big part of it too it's very difficult because uh, you, you said that uh, they uh, don't uh, want to go to screening for example screen. yeah because um for them it's not a let's say something uh, the outcome they can't feel it so exactly they, if I go for screening, they will find it. Yeah. So there is this really negative thing too about it. So I know even in Singapore, they have this problem, right? So while they have fantastic healthcare and it's all free and screening, people don't go to the screenings. It's quite interesting to see the statistics. I think it's changing there, but now they've made a really concerted effort. But say like eight years ago in Singapore, they had terrible, terrible results, actually an uptake of screening. Um, because people didn't want to go. I think that's also thinking about where people are being screened, right? If you're screening at a cancer center, people don't want to go there, you know? So I think this integration of more with, um, you know, general practitioners is really, really important. Uh, I, I guess uh, they instinctively uh, applied what is called in uh, literature, the right uh, not to know. Uh, because yeah. nowadays there is a lot of disputes about this yeah, right of the, the right patient. To forget and the right yeah. not to know. Not and that know. Like, so oh, I, yeah. I guess they <laughs> apply this without uh, knowing because they don't really want yeah. to know the, the, the truth. Yeah. About. And it's the financial aspect too, right? So most people will, you know, it brings great financial catastrophe to their families. So um, that is part of the abandonment also, why people are abandoned um, yeah. in their tree, because they will bankrupt the family in general, often. And uh, you mentioned about the, the financial aspects. Uh, for example, in case of survivors, um, how long uh, 
it had to take for, uh, let's say, a survivor to not to get back to work, but to be considered uh, a person that like it was before. Because, for example, in Romania, we had a big issue on this one. Uh, if you are a cancer survivor, you don't have the same right like a normal person. And since last year, uh, it is what is called the right to be forgotten. So after five years of survivorships, you are now again considered like a normal person from banks in the first place and for a woman. I mean, I think place. Yeah, every place is different, right? And for every person, it's different because it's, you know, it's so personal for each each person and their caregiver too and their families on on when that that is i mean i do think people do consider the five year rule but i mean i don't know i it's that is so subjective and something i don't even like to think about because i think it's just so personal and and putting that medical sim cuz it really there is no rhyme or reason to i mean there are statistics to say right after a certain amount of time um you're less likely the longer you're out the less likely you are to have a recurrence but you never know yeah. i mean and and how can we judge that you know that scan scanxiety i'm still 18 and a half years later i'm still like waiting for something else to happen you know <laughs> so i don't know that anyone ever feels fully over it yeah, yeah, you yeah. know and uh, yeah live uh, every moment with uh, this question mark above you so yeah unfortunately um, we don't have much time so i would like to ask you yeah. one more question um, you have written a very interesting article uh, titled redefine priorities a call for patient-centered cancer care and research yeah. could you point out the key points of this article of your thoughts? Yeah, so I think there's, you know, how do we make things more patient-centered? Well, it's being inclusive, right? So we often are talked about uh, being pe patient-centered, people-centered, person-centered research, but when you really look at the numbers, you know, of the more than, if you look between the years 2016 and 2020, there were $24.5 billion spent globally on cancer research, um, but only a tiny bit was allocated to research that actually showed benefit to patients. Um, you know, it didn't go to that. There is very little, um, most of the spending was actually on preclinical research, which is essential, but it rarely ever results in meaningful, anything meaningful to patients. And particularly in low resource settings where now it's the numbers are up to, you know, 80% of the cancer burden now lies is going to particularly as we move forward, um, you know, over the next 10 years, it's going to move shift even further to the burden being in low and middle income countries and low resource settings, even low resource settings within high, high income settings as well. But this, you know, there's this imbalance in research funding that it, it highlights this fundamental gap, right? That beside there may be advances in treatment options and survival rates, but the lived experience of patients and their families still is largely under-investigated, under-explored, and under-measured. So looking at quality of life, symptom management, psychological, psychosocial support, the socioeconomic implications of cancer return to work, those things are really not prioritized and encouraged. And, you know, so we need a shift in where we're sending this. I call for a paradigm shift, right? And how the priorities are set. So, you know, making sure that there is more inclusivity in decision-making that engages patients, caregivers, patient advocates in what research priorities are. Is that aligning to the needs of people with cancer? We need to look at that equity and funding again. Where does that funding going? Who has access to it, especially in LMICs where this burden is? Then we also need more interdisciplinary approaches, I think, to really encourage collaboration across different sectors, um, you know, in the medical centers and also with social work 
and lived experience to create these more holistic care models. And then we need policy reform to back all of this up, right? Where patient-centered research becomes more of the norm and prioritized and that people with lived experience are included with that. And then again, developing indicators that can guide this kind of implementation process. So that's kind of the gist of that article, I think. Yeah, you, you mentioned about uh, uh, $4.5 billion in four years on research. Uh, for example, in Romania last year, uh, the population spent 7 billion on medications and drugs. So uh, it, it, yeah, is, a it, it is a reason yeah. for, for not investing in research because, uh, yeah. Right. So, I mean, I kind of argued that point a little bit at World Cancer Congress, too, on health literacy, in that the U.S. in particular, which is where I live, is a healthcare industry. We don't really have a healthcare system. And that building health literacy doesn't actually help the healthcare industry, does it? So, um, you know, people do look at uh, preventative measures and ways to avoid cancers. It doesn't really benefit this industry. So, yeah. Okay. Caroline, thank you very much for this nice and interesting discussion. Uh, thank you again for accepting my invitation. Good thank luck you. on your future projects, on thank your future you. conferences, and we are waiting you again with news uh, from NGO Lives in Cancer Care. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.